I thought you might find it interesting to um, to look at uh, some of my life, I guess, through um, experiences in India, and uh, and then give you an introduction a bit to the monastery I live in in Thailand, Anandagiri, which is in Pechabun Province, sort of. A, we're about five or six hours north of, of uh, Bangkok by road. Um, so it's, it, you know, I have several sections to this. Uh, a good deal of it will be taken up in, with, uh, with uh, pilgrimage slides. Um, there are a lot of Sri Lankans here and a lot of Westerners, as, you know, Westerners, non-Sri non Lankans. I'm not sure what the term should be there. Hi, Peter. And... Um, I'm uh, I'm Canadian, as as Adrian uh, said, and uh, um, so I'm 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 kind of used to what I call what we tend to call a Western audience. And one of the things that I realized early on in my life as a as a Buddhist in the West is that, um, uh, at least in North America, and I expect in in Europe as well, perhaps in in Australia, uh, at least non-ethnic Buddhists tend to come to the tradition because they're interested in oh, relaxation or certainly um, insight or becoming wise. Uh, the, the faculty of faith is usually not particularly developed and that's uh, due to many, many things. So one of the, one of the reasons that I was so interested in, um, in um, um, sponsoring and, and, and leading one of these uh, pilgrimages a few years ago, and I'm doing another one in next year, is uh, to, to, to bring kind of my people, in a, in a sense, uh, to this uh, marvelous place and, and uh, allow them, permit them, open, open them up to experiencing this, uh, um, uh, the, the nature of pilgrimage in, in the first hand and uh, in the first person. So these are some slides from this, and you'll recognize some faces from, from friendly BSV folk. I'm going to have to go through this quickly because um, um, uh, I've got lots of slides. So um, we, um, um, we more or less started out in, in, in Bodh Gaya, and uh, of course this is the seat of the Buddha's enlightenment uh, under the Bodhi tree. Um, the uh, temple you see in the background behind the three monks there um, is, was, was built later to commemorate this great event and accomplishment. There, of course, you must grow Bodhi trees in, 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 in uh, Australia, don't you? Yeah, okay. So the, Nothing novel there. And there's a, a night view of the Mahabodhi temple. Um, at any time of the day, when it's open, it's open from 5 until 9. They, they shortened the hours a few years ago after a, a, a kind of a minor bomb event. But uh, at any time of the day that you're there, uh, there are people from all nationalities uh, coming. Uh, there are a lot of Sri Lankans, in fact, in that photo, probably all of the, the good white-clad uh, folk are Sri Lankans. Um, but, uh, but they are primarily Asian. You don't see too many <coughs> um, Europeans or North Americans uh, in Bodh Gaya, as a rule. There's uh, lots of flowers. This is um, and uh, this is not news to to uh, to Asians, of course, but again to to Westerners, it's a, it's quite a, a novel experience to uh, bedeck things in flowers. And uh, this was an occasion here. You see the the uh, big bundle there. We found out that we could uh, offer five thousand garlands. You 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 hire people to make the garlands, and they put them all up. They they ring the whole temple with it. So for certain events and to honor certain um, uh, individuals uh, who, um, for various reasons, we, we did this a few times. Uh, I was just there, as was Liv, uh, not so long ago in March. I was just there for three weeks this time, but uh, Liv was there for six weeks, five, seven? Um, the Buddha Rupa there is called the Buddha Metta, and this is in the uh, an inner room, <coughs> the only one that is accessible in the Mahabodhi temple. And that must be one of the most beloved Buddha Rupas in the world. Um, um, it's a very special... I think you have to... Um, 
you owe it to yourself to 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 try to to come to one of these places in in this life i think because uh there is a kind of energy there is a kind of what they call in thai palang power spiritual power uh which is available i think people resonate with uh, with different places probably on the pilgrimage tour but um th there is something that that a person can often feel um, it's a very good place. Any of them are very good places to make determinations, for example, to you know make resolutions, you might say, um, uh, regarding your spiritual life, regarding your um, your um, commitment to virtue and and uh, uh, the uh, your aspirations, for example. Oh, there, uh, Ajahn Achalo and I are. This is a few years ago now. That particular picture sitting on the wall we we um his favorite spot was uh on the what's that the uh east the the uh what is that now the the north wall and uh, it stays cool all day because the sun never reaches you and you think of meditation as a very very quiet thing no talking it's a silent retreat now folks you know but in fact the reality of being there is quite different you can there's a good sized crowd as you see they are typically circumambulating the temple Ajahn Nachala is quite fond of sticking earplugs in he usually actually has a toque over his head too just to just to kind of mute some of the sensory input And uh, this is a. <clears throat> I'm standing there to the uh, there beside a, a, a spot that commemorates the Jongram path that the that the Lord Buddha uh, spent a week uh, doing walking meditation in uh, uh, after his enlightenment. And uh, to my to my left, I guess it is. Uh, is a is a lovely old Nyingma monk. I, I see him a lot. We're kind of friends, and um, uh, quite often I actually sit on 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 his side of the uh, of the temple because it's not very crowded, and um, we've come to know each other a little bit. He's a he's a lovely old man. He recites the uh, Kanjur, I think, uh, which is one of the Tibetan canons, and he has uh, gone right through it now. Uh, this is no mean feat. That uh, that version of the of the literature is 120 volumes and there is the the Bodhi tree uh, in its uh, that's a good shot actually a pretty good shot it's hard to get any kind of expansive sense of it but uh, there you see it and uh, a couple of our friends these are all Canadians here in this particular oh no there's I think that's Frank they're standing with his white hat to the one side and here's a photo uh, actually taken fairly recently in March. This is uh, just after Ajahn Achalo had completed uh, 3,000 hours meditating right there. Uh, this is a determination he made, and I think it took him about 10 visits to the Mahabodhi Temple to do it. Uh, I came along on three of those. Um, I've now been to India seven times, and... Um, this is the other group of monastics that made up our, our, our little uh, group. And then we were accompanied by a lovely group of kind of alternating lay folk. And uh, this is uh, the kind of picture that sometimes gets taken. This is actually uh, when we were doing some chanting immediately after uh, Ajahn had finished his determination. The second monk in that row you see there had actually just finished his thousandth hour. Now, for the ties, and I don't know, I don't know what your uh, perceptions are about these things, but this is this is an unadorned uh, photograph, and a tie looking at that, and maybe Sri Lankans as well, will see something going on. Uh, when when this photograph was shown to a to a great monk, uh, very psychic, and uh, has a, a great deal of. Um, um, it has a very gifted vision. Uh, he said, "Oh, that was a, that was a, a Deva's Nagas coming to rejoice in the, in the the completion of the determination." He he said, "Oh," and Ajahn Ashala asked him, "Oh, did they come from Bodhgaya or where? Or did they come from Anandagiri?" He said, "No, they're from all over the place." <laughs> so.
So this is um, just spreading out now a little from Bodh Gaya. We were we did a couple of little uh, uh, side journeys. The the cave photo there. Uh, we we climbed. <coughs> into a, um, an area where the, the uh, Buddha-to-be had accomplished or had spent years in um, his ascetic endeavors. And, uh, and so there's a, a, a picture, a, a statue of the, the Buddha in his ascetic phase prior to his full awakening. And there's the Mahabodhi temple across from the Nyanjana River, which um, has about as much water as I've ever seen in it, I'm sure, in the in the monsoon, it's uh, more full. So, we uh, from Bodh Gaya, it's quite easy to get to Rajagir. It's only a couple of hours away. And uh, Rajagir um, has uh, the Vulture's Peak, which is uh, a place that's um, important in Theravada, but also uh, within the Mahayana. So some of the Mahay some of the um, Prajnaparamita literature was, uh, or, or uh, uh, knowledge was was revealed by the Buddha on the um, on Vulture's Peak. So here we are uh, doing, I think, a morning uh, puja here. If you get up good and early, you can actually see the sunrise from this, and it's quite spectacular, and uh, it's really quite marvelous. This is one of my favorite spots, I think, in the uh, in the pilgrimage uh, site because, um, you know, um, the archaeological ruins that we see they're they're more or less constructed. They're they're made to look like ruins, but um, uh, bricks don't last uh, 2,500 years uh, very well, or 2,300 years or whatever it might be. This is a cave, though, and it probably hasn't changed a very great deal. And this particular cave is uh, is just underneath what we just saw on the top of Vulture's Peak. This particular cave is reckoned to be the one in which uh, Venerable Sariputta gained awakening. So you can read about this. There's a sutta, um, the sutta regarding uh, long nails. And um, that's the cave that he became enlightened in. It's uh, uh, it's a very moving spot for for me to, to visit, and I'm sure everyone. Next to it actually is a cave where Mahamogalana stayed. And here we are down in the uh, bamboo uh, grove. This, we were very fortunate because we were there on a, um, an Oposita night. So we, uh, and we were, we were allowed to, uh, to use the, the uh, bamboo grove during that evening. It's a very lovely spot. Next to Kushnagar, which is where the Buddha uh, uh, passed into Parinibbana. There's our group there. Um, since I was there, uh, well, when the, the first time I came, there was no guardrail around uh, the reclining Buddha here. That, but everything changes, and uh, they're, I guess, just trying to keep, uh, you know, the, the people's touching the Buddha uh, uh, at a minimum. And going from one place to another, of course, you're, you're on the, the Indian roads and, and uh, it's not um, um, uncommon to pass other Buddhist uh, uh, stupas. And uh, there's a good example uh, on the one side of, um, of an Ashokan pillar, which would have been uh, kind of re-erected at some point, but they... Uh, they are maintained quite remarkably. One of the interesting things about the Ashokan pillars is that they um, they're they're made from sandstone, and um, the the pillar itself is a kind of polished sandstone. They call it the Ashokan polish because nobody, no geologist, no whatever, can figure out how you get how you polish sandstone in this way. They've apparently they've never been able to replicate it. to Jitavana, uh, a great site, of course. Um, the Buddha delivered um, a large percentage of the Majjhima Nikaya from, from his, uh, his range retreats uh, uh, in Jitavana. This is the Ananda, the, uh, Mahab uh, Ananda Bodhi tree here. 
very ancient. And here we are, the monks are seated in the uh, perfumed kuti where the Buddha resided for many Again, you'll, you'll see the structure around us. Well, obviously that isn't, uh, that isn't original. Um, archaeologists simply tried to establish the site of, of certain suttas and, and from various literate, literary references would try to establish uh, whose uh, uh, kuti it would have been. And then from uh, bricks and whatnot uh, found in the area, the rubble, basically, they would have, they would have re, you know, kind of mortared these these things and probably put in new bricks as well. But it it does it it does uh, provide an effective way to visualize the uh, the scene. We were treated one night in this area to uh, really remarkable Cambodian chanting. There was a there was a monk here, there who was a just a striking uh, chanter, and there was a large, large group. Um, and it was either that, that group or a group of uh, Sri Lankans who lit all these butter lamps uh, on this whole promenade there. To Lumbini, the uh, place where the Buddha was born. Lumbini is the is the most recent site to be developed as one of the holy sites, and as a result, there is a degree of order. Also, of course, it's in just inside the the border of Nepal, so um, there are fewer people. There are a lot of Indians there, but but still, even so, there are uh, many fewer people there. It's not as crowded. It's more relaxed, and uh, because they had an opportunity to to um, um, force some planning on the development of buildings and that. Uh, it, <laughs> it makes a bit of sense, you know, the national, national temples were given plots of land and they're all uh, laid out nicely. And uh, things are in, you know, are, are newer and in uh, better shape as a rule. There we are. Sorry, I'm looking at, at two, and I sometimes forget you're not also looking at the one I'm seeing. Um, this is there's a very long promenade with um, with um, with uh, this this um, kind of canal almost uh, going along it. It's a lovely place to do walking meditation as you go into the main um, uh, area commemorating the Buddha's birth. And uh, to the to the side of that um, water uh, uh, area is, um, I think that was a Tibetan one of the Tibetan temples there. Again, fairly new. That one might be about six years old, or well, say eight or under ten years old. Just uh, some of the some of the retreatants walking back. Unless you're really determined, it's obvious uh, you, you you don't do these things in chronological order. So, the next logical spot um, after Lumbini then is to end up down in Saranath because you can fly out. In those days, you could fly out from Varanasi back to Thailand. So here we are at the great uh, the, the great stupa at Saranath, where the Buddha gave his first uh, teaching to the five ascetics. Um, it's a, a magnificent site, and it's it's laid out nicely because you you do have to pay to enter this place. It's it's um, run by the uh, it's run by the um, uh, archaeological survey of, of India, and uh, so you have to pay to get in. And you just kind of walk along. You turn a corner, all of a sudden, for the first time, you see the the great uh, the great stupa. Uh, on the other side there, or the on the side of the, the one picture, of course, is a uh, picture of the Ganges. Um, that's a night shot. I, I'm kind of troubling because I thought, well, it could be pre-dawn as well, but it looks too dark for that. We, uh, we went out on the Ganges uh, uh, for the dawn ride. Um, that's... Uh, quite a charming kind of experience. <clears throat> our our uh, intention was, though, to visit one of the burning ghats. There are um, there are two that I know of, two that I visited. The one that most people seem to go to is the is the uh, upper class uh, ghat, which is downstream, a ways, and the uh, lower class uh, burning ghat is uh, is upstream, and it's a much more lively place. Uh, Ajahn Achilo and I visited it, visited it uh, one night uh, a few years ago, and um, 
it's <laughs> there's somehow there's it's more uh, joyous and, and kind of interesting in a way. There is a somber quality to the other uh, God. And um, something like um, between, uh, I think, I think we we're told between 120 and 200 bodies are burned there a day. Uh, that's at the one, just at the one upper class uh, uh, ghat. That's Yasmin, I think. I'm, that's me walking along there, and I think that's Yasmin in the blue coat. So, and here's. Uh, after dawn, the laundry gets uh, started drying on the sides and whoops. And, right, and then um, we did some chanting on the Ganges and uh, there was, uh, when we were, um, during this last tour that we had, um, two uh, families had lost uh, children. In, the, in maybe two or three years previous to to our trip, so both of them kind of um, honored, acknowledged, and memorialized uh, their loss, and and we we chanted uh, uh, the metta sutta and that kind of thing. So there you are at the stupa itself, and uh, also the group of us uh, listening to some teachings. Now um, this is a trip that. Ajahn Achalo and I made uh, a year ago last December, I guess, to, uh, I finally made it to Eastern and, or rather to Western India. Um, lovely trip to Sanchi, Anjanta, and Alora. Sanchi is the uh, home of the famous uh, Sanchi gates. There are four intact gates that were re-erected uh, in the last decades, I guess, in, in very good shape. That's our group there. And then <clears throat> Ajanta, and, and actually we uh, performed Patimoka there, which is quite special too. We happened to, the monks, uh, we happened to arrive there on a, um, on a uh, full moon, I think it was. And um, so the monks uh, chanted Patimoka and um, did our kind of um, by uh, our, our, our twice monthly uh, obligations there. And then Ajanta and Alora are these remarkable cave um, settlements in which um, Buddhist, uh, Ajanta is solely Buddhist in, in nature and it, it was, I think, uh, constructed or I guess excavated, uh, sculpted is, better, is maybe the best word, uh, I think between the second century BC and the second century roughly CE, AD rather. Uh, Alora is Buddhist, but also Hindu and Jain, and it started something like this second or fourth, and, and to the eighth, maybe I'm a little bit off here. The trade routes changed, and this is they they were were, were developed in these places because wealthy traders, merchants were coming through particular well-established routes, and um, and 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 therefore wanted to sponsor um, uh, these temples. And when they changed, then the the, the money and and, and the uh, the craft went to uh, Elora in in a later in later centuries. They're very ancient, and you have to remind yourself again and again and again that that uh, this is actually a volcanic basalt. So these are these are true monoliths. That is, they're made from a single piece of rock. <laughs> And they are, some of them are quite vast uh, interior spaces. There are um, many, many uh, temples here. I'm going to say both of them uh, um, contain more than 30 temples of varying sizes. Some of them are, are, were never quite finished. Maybe the funding ran, ran out or what have you. Uh, Ajanta is in a kind of horseshoe shaped uh, um, area. Below it is this river that also runs in this horseshoe shape. So those pillars, in other words, weren't constructed somewhere and then, and then hoisted up there and put in carefully and measured and everything. No, they were just cut straight out of the rock, straight out of the mountain as you see them. So inside that particular um, uh, cave, there may be 
eight or ten rooms. Uh, there are there will be um, a main meditation hall. Uh, Buddha Rupa is also just carved in situ, and <laughs> there they are. Uh, there can be there can be little rooms off to the side of the main hall that that contain uh, kutis or uh, little little um, uh, uh, cells basically for uh, monks to stay in and live perhaps years and years. So the 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 kind of the the kind of craft that would be required and intelligence and skill that would have been required to construct to construct these things is is just staggering to me. There you see the uh, vaulted roof, uh, vaulted ceiling of a of a lovely um, uh, uh, temple inside. We were uh, we were all accompanying actually a very senior Wapapong monk named uh, Lumpur Anake. And uh, <clears throat> this is one of several occasions that he had to, you know, we had to spend a little time in meditation for him to give some, uh, some Dhamma instruction. You can see how uh, beautiful and airy uh, the space is. Um, so Buddhist pilgrims going to India are, you know, seeking to to uh, see and reflect on various uh, sites. But of course, you're also in India, and this means various things. Um, it can mean um, a little bit of stomach trouble sometimes if you're not careful in how you eat, and if you make the mistake of maybe using uh, tap water to brush your teeth with. But um, uh, you, you also, and for me coming from Canada, um, I'm sure less so for folks who were born in Sri Lanka, and so you're, you're, you know, you're kind of part of uh, the subcontinent culture to a large degree. But coming from Western Canada, this, this, these kinds of sites are really uh, uh, quite, quite special and uh, very impactful in their own way. You can't visit India without having some chai. And so these are, uh, this is a morning uh, chai wala here. With this, uh, with this tour that we took to Western India, there was a fantastic photographer uh, who accompanied, he, he seems to go wherever Lumpur Anate goes. And uh, so uh, I, will, I can take no credit for most of these. Uh, he, he captures some beautifully candid uh, shots. I did take this one. I'm very pleased with, <laughs> with how this dog, this is actually at the Mahabodhi temple. The, there are lots of dogs there and man, are they ever rough on each other when they're, when they're working out, you know, who sleeps where and that. But um, for, of course, for the people, they're very sweet because they get fed quite often and uh, they're very sweet tempered. So anyway, he's, this old guy's having a sleep one afternoon. There's a great deal of difference between, uh, I mean, the main Buddha sites that we were in uh, in, in the east are in Bihar, which is, um, I think, the poorest state still, even though it's uh, it's it's been doing a lot better in in in, uh, pre in the last decade or two. But it's um, it, it was very poorly run for many many uh, years. And Uttar Pradesh, between the two of them, there must be 120 million people, I suppose. So uh, they're very, very cramped and, and relatively quite poor. The West and the South are, are very different in character. This is a health and safety alert. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Oh, it's amazing what they can do with, with bamboo. But uh, those... those uh, those um, rungs are pretty far apart too. Uh, the women, I think, would be carrying uh, cotton there. It's the time of year. I remember one time walking through the little village uh, that you don't usually get to in Bodh Gaya, and um, and there were five or six women. They're all sitting around chatting away about whatever, and they were doing something with a stick and cotton. And it later occurred to me they're making basically Q-tips. So the cotton was out, and that was what they were going to do that morning. And probably they, or maybe their husbands, had cut them pieces of, I suppose, bamboo about this long, and they were just, you know, crafting these Q-tips with them. Uh, this is back in Bodh Gaya here. This is a group of uh, blind uh, musicians. Um, it's 
just trying to think if there are any uh, musical instruments beyond drums. There are a lot of drums. I think it's all percussion, actually. They're blind, though. Um, those of you who have been on Indian roads know that it's, uh, they're rather noisy places. And uh, that's because, by law, you have to honk when you pass. And, uh, and uh, uh, the big trucks, especially, and, and the uh, buses have very unusual horns. They're maybe, they have to be two, maybe three times louder than normal domestic, you know, uh, uh, polite Australian horns. And uh, they often have funny repeating tunes, and it's a cacophony. This is by this photographer. I mean, some of the shots that he took are just so delightful. <clears throat> Waiting for an Indian train. On an Indian train. And a very sweet little picture. One of the, I mean, I, I loved uh, the west of India because uh, you actually uh, see more, uh, you know, you could say middle class uh, Indians. Just, I mean, after, if you spend weeks uh, or, you know, a month and a half, say, in Bodh Gaya and you're passing the beggar children every day, uh, four times a day, basically, back and forth, back and forth, and they and their families, usually they're just their mothers, will live, some of them, just on the side of the road. So you get used to uh, one level of, of Indian society, which is extraordinarily um, uh, impoverished, desperate. Just there's, there's, there's nowhere to go from there. Uh, they're right on the ground, and that's, that's where they'll stay. So it, it is also delightful to see, um, you know, um, young people who are bright and energetic and, and have a future that they can imagine. Uh, these are girls they are on a school outing, so Ajanta and Alora, you know, they get school trips. They get buses going, and they have these harried teachers <laughs> keeping track of 20 kids. They usually walk around holding hands, uh, keeping keeping together. But they're, uh, it's just so delightful to feel that youthful, healthy, intelligent uh, energy. Okay, I, I have no idea how we're doing for time. Well, I can see the time, but I don't know where... Oh golly, we're about halfway through my slides. Okay, this is. We'll just stop when we need to. Someone just tell me. Okay, venerable, stop. Now to uh, Ananda Giri. Uh, I thought you'd like to see just some of the scenes from our area. It's a. It's a very mountainous or um, um, an interesting <coughs> geological area. It's just we're on actually the ridge of a hill. And uh, Kalka, the, the area that we're, we're in, is, is very mountainous. This is a, a Nepali uh, sculpted chedi that, was, uh, that we purchased and commissioned and, and then came to Anandagiri in pieces. And we put it together in, in uh, concrete and filled it with concrete and also a few thousand uh, blessed amulets and things of this kind. That's my walking meditation path. <laughs> covered paths, there's just nothing better than a covered walking meditation path. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, so that's the area of Kauko. It's, uh, it's quite distinctive. Um, we get mist uh, quite often in the, uh, in the monsoon. There's a lovely um, Guanyin or Avalokiteshvara statue from, uh, uh, sculpted in China and sent to uh, Anandagiri. And here's a sandstone Buddha Rupa produced, um, I think that one was produced south of Bangkok. Whoops. Another picture of the... This is a large platform. It's since uh, changed a little in character. It's wider now. And, uh, but we have three uh, Rupas. Uh, one Maitreya, and then the middle one is the Buddha, the Maitre uh, um, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha. And then the Avalokiteshvara, which you've just seen, is on the, uh, the nearest side, out of sight. And there's high tech comes to Pechaboon. There's You can see those lovely uh, windmills up above there. Um, the previously, the previously, our largest project was the Damasala, which uh, was started in 2015 and finished in that year as well. And um, 
people with the pe pens and papers there, they're just actually kind of working out some of the details. That's when it actually got started excavating the the site and and one of the first things that happens is you've got to get a buddha rupa and move it to where you want to be and there it sits because you have to build the building around it that's uh, about a four ton buddha rupa and it's at the far end of our of the sala and um, um, other than if you wanted to leave a very large opening for a, a, a forklift to get through there's no way of getting it in there after the fact so there it is and there's also a lovely uh, Guan Yin, which you see to the uh, to the left of it. So they got covered over during the construction process. There's a building occurring, and uh, at the back behind these people, you see a what is that? Well, that's a Bodhi tree. You can do the most outrageous things with trees in in Thailand, and they still keep growing. So. Um, uh, some some people we, we we decided we wanted a bodhi tree in the kind of plaza area in front of the the the, the uh, sala and uh, some people said well we'll 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 get a bodhi tree ajahn how how big would you like one ajahn Achula said i don't know i mean as big as you can get you know he's thinking like you know something you know something really you know good size you know something not not to play around with this small stuff so they went two provinces away and, and got this uh, now, how is it going to grow? Well, by the end of the first uh, rains, it was it was planted in there during at the very beginning of the monsoon. I think this is what it looked like at the end of that year, of, of, of that monsoon. So maybe four months later. And this is about a year old. This picture here, and it's it's bigger and more bushy even now. Uh, and remembering that it came basically with with its branches completely cut off. It had been out of the ground for six years, I think. Um, yeah, it's quite a quite a thing. So there's the sala nearly done there, and this is what it looks like now. And there's the interior, all done with the Buddha Rupa still in place. The monks sit on the the right side in an L shape, coming all the way towards towards us in the door. And there's uh, one night uh, just a few months ago now uh, with it pretty much in use. Here's a, a site of uh, the um, Mechis area, so the uh, women monastics. We have one woman, Mechi uh, Amy, who is there most of the year, most of every year, for the last maybe four years. Um, but uh, there's another um, more senior uh, Mechi who comes from time to time. And uh, we've had women stay there for, for periods of time. We, um, that's a kind of, um, you know, a discretionary thing because the people who have purchased those properties and have paid to build them, sometimes they come uh, for periods of time as well. A lot of life, wildlife. I, I don't have to tell Australians about snakes, but we have lots of cobras. So that's one that was just outside of my kuti, finishing off a frog, I think. Took that. I saw that one several times, about five feet long. Not so long ago, though, um, a pair of king cobras, they were apparently nine or ten feet long, were seen mating um, uh, down our still on monastery property. One of the villagers saw them. We have a lot of these, uh, these fellas, these beautiful, uh, they're called white lipped vipers, but we call them, we just call them bamboo vipers. And some gratuitous. Cat shots, smoky and ginger. <clears throat> One of the things that that is uh, very rewarding about about being there and and uh, and establishing a monastery where we are, um, they our our area as you see is very hilly, and so the the uh, farmers use these hills. They'll they'll drive up and down with their tractors up, uh, very frightening inclines actually. I've spent quite a bit of time myself on tractors. <laughs> I, uh, I kind of shake my head. But um, so uh, what we inherited, basically, what we were given is basically old cornfields, probably Monsanto corn, you know, and uh, rice. They would, they would alternate rice, corn, beans, squash, that sort of thing. So we have now planted, we, we estimate probably 20,000 trees have actually lived of what we've planted. 
So, um, and when you do these, I mean, monks can't dig holes and all of that. So we will plant trees, but other people, uh, sometimes the army will come along. They're, they're very happy to participate in these kinds of public works. Uh, school kids will come, or maybe um, several nurses from a hospital will come. They ties to love to organize themselves around wholesome activities and, and get their pictures taken. So, so there you go. There's a... We plant them in rows. They don't end up in rows. Of course, they, they seed themselves elsewhere. But uh, our area has this particular grass that we have to cut several times a year. And when I first told the Canadian this, he said, oh, why do I have to cut the grass? And I said, because it grows three meters high. So uh, when, you're, when you're planting a tree that's, that's, a, that's a little twig that's, uh, you know, uh, half a meter high, um, it's going to uh, get... Um, it's not going to live very long uh, with, with that kind of grass uh, to compete with. So we plant them in rows very orderly, and then we our grass cutters with their big um, gas-powered machines um, can, uh, can, can easily figure out where the trees are supposed to be. And that's, this one was, this picture was taken a year after those little ones were put in, and this is still a year old, so this particular side of the hill is much more, um, you know, bushy now. Uh, but basically, many of the trees that you see, we've planted, because some of them are six years old, and as a Canadian, I'm just, I'm just startled, uh, aghast, really, when I, when I see how much trees can grow in a few years in a, in a tropical environment or semi-tropical. And there's some of our army people. I like this picture here, because I have to tell you, the, the, uh, the soldier uh, to the, well, on the right of the picture in a kind of nicer uniform, he was a senior uh, s uh, s army official in, our, in, our, um, in Pechiboon, I think. And I, I was kind of impressed because part of his dress kit is he wears spurs. He wears spurs on his boots. I mean, I, I found this quite delightful. <laughs> So when you have a lot of people, you have to feed them. So this is part of the uh, obligation and uh, kind of happy duty that we have when we, we get a lot of the, our villagers coming up to participate in these things. Our villagers are not uh, wealthy people by any stretch of the imagination, but they are always willing to help the monastery. They're very proud of uh, us being there, actually. And they, they do recognize that we're, we're Vinaya-keeping uh, monks. And um, some of them come up quite regularly, not too many. But for bigger events, uh, we'll have 100 or so. So they're, um, they're a, an indispensable and very delightful presence uh, for, for the monastery. There's some more of the trees, and those ones are getting a little bit more... Developed and and, and th th that picture there, I think almost all of the trees you see there will have been planted within the last uh, seven years. The um, um, oh gee, what's the what's the famous Australian tree? Um, I always want to say arbutus, but. Gum tree, the gum tree. Uh, we have a they they grow a lot of gum trees now in Thailand as well, and we have some, and and they're ten meters at least, and they were grown like. They, they, were, they were planted seven years ago at, at this height, so very impressive. Some more scenes. This would have been at uh, probably our Katina a, few, uh, a couple of years ago. And you might even recognize, I think this monk uh, standing here might be, he's Australian for sure, perhaps you recognize him. There again is the main sala being put to, put to good use. And uh, I probably won't get through these, but uh, now the biggest project lately now has been the Chedi project. Some of you will have received photos of this uh, in, in recent, uh, recent year or so. But um, it, um, it requires a, a, a lot of uh, foundation and footing. And I mean, re rebar just isn't that um, interesting to most people, but... But uh, you can't, you can't, you can't build a. Um, I don't know how what the estimated tonnage of the chedi itself, because it's just basically solid. It's either concrete or um, or uh, granite brick or or uh, um, baked brick. So it's very very heavy, and it'll be about 18 meters in height with uh, with um, 
marble and sandstone statues on it. So it's a very, very he uh, uh, heavy thing. So, okay, finished with the foundation. Here are the villagers back again. We've got loads of bricks and the monks and the villagers come in and uh, hand move all of these bricks a few tons at a time. Here's a first setting down the first few bricks uh, for the foundation. <clears throat> now, Ajanachalo uh, does not permit any kind of building to take place uh, at Anandagiri without its being beautiful. <laughs> so, uh, and he's very inspired by artistic uh, uh, um, inspiration and and uh, and. Uh, projects. So he's he's been uh, commissioning various works, uh, uh, sculptural works from, uh, most of them are coming from uh, uh, a sculpture gallery or factory in uh, the Cheng Rai area and also uh, another one, uh, another fellow in from uh, Korat. These are, um, this is actually the, the Buddha Metta. So this is a, a um, an image taken from the Buddha Metta from Bodh Gaya, and it's carved in uh, Indian um, marble. And there it's getting kind of polished up on site now at Anandagiri. Everything has to be craned, lifted in. I'm sh I, I don't expect the women are, are particularly interested in these crane shots, but you know, we're in a funny sort of spot. So you bring this huge crane, you know, with those ones with the, the, the double axles in the front, all, you know, four steering wheels. So we bring a huge crane in and its job sometimes is simply to lift, to lift other cranes onto the, onto the actual platform where the, uh, where the thing is being built. So, Okay, now this is that, uh, you can see the, uh, the Chedi uh, just starting in the background there and then there's this uh, large platform. So when we have uh, big gatherings, we can have them outside here and we could probably have 300 people there if we needed to. This is a, a, um, a, an instance in which uh, Tanajana Nun came to bless uh, large groups of <clears throat> sacred objects uh, to be placed inside the chedi. There are some kind of, partly to make it lighter, but there are some sort of rooms, some spaces that will be complete, they are completely encased by the chedi, but they contain uh, tens of thousands of uh, blessed objects. And there will be uh, large numbers of uh, Buddha relics as well, or sacred relics on the very top of the chedi when that's finally done. Those jars there contain, you know, thousands of el uh, relics. The last um, uh, installation we had just a few days ago contained 120,000 uh, uh, relics, or uh, sorry, um, uh, amulets. There's Ajahnanan. This is an early occasion when he came, and there's. Construction. Now this is the last time he came, so now the chedi is in much better shape, as you'll see. And uh, there we are, the monks chanting. Uh, I think you'll recognize some of you. Um, Ajahn, um, what's his name now? Ajahn, uh, he's beside me. I've forgotten his name. Nyana, do you know him? He's, he's at uh, Warburton. A tall uh, Kiwi monk? Kiwi monk. Yeah. Yeah, he's really tall. Six, four. Nana Depot, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, we get the we get these big jars up into the chedi because it's it's now quite hard uh, by a kind of pulley system, and so there is Ajahn and Nun, st you know, starting the first uh, round up, and uh, there's the the chedi now. So this is quite recently taken, so you can see it's it's gained a, a lot of altitude. It's um, about halfway. Uh, uh, to its full height, and I may just uh, won't take this much. With this, this is on Ajahnacho's birthday, so he deserves a, a good shot of his smiling face. And uh, quickly through the the village, they're they're farmers uh, almost in, exclusively, so they're typical morning scenes: monks on Bindabat and. Uh, Grandma and her and her son there, her grandson.
you get to know these people. I mean, I've, I've seen little children that are four days old, you know, after they're brought in in the public. Some of them now going to school. Um, it's, um, for me, it's quite moving, actually, uh, to... I, I actually took a bunch of pictures of them all just before I left because I said, you know, when I'm in, when I'm in Canada, you know, I can show people your f pictures and I can look at them myself and spread metta. Okay, I guess we did make it through. Okay, there's a little girl. She's the, she's the end of the show, so good. Yeah, so... The, Yeah, monastic life. I would never have thought um, 30 years ago when I was living in Canada as a as a father of two and you know doing whatever I was doing that I'd end up uh, living in a place like that and uh, helping to helping uh, with the establishment of a, a monastery in a part of rural Thailand. So um, there are uh, there are. Uh, it's quite a marvel to to have this way of life still available in the world, and uh, I'm uh, I think monks are one of the things that's recommended that we do is is, re is recall with gratitude uh, all of the sources of blessings that enable us to continue doing this. Of course, one of the th one of the great benefits to living in Thailand is that you live in a place in which people know who you are and what you do, and. Um, that's um, in contrast to uh, living in Australia, certainly, and uh, and uh, I spent my first nine years, I guess, in North America as a monk. So uh, that's that's of course a very different environment. So anyway, I think I'll leave it there. Stop my rambling. Thanks for your attention.